So welcome to the next talk in our collective series. I'm extremely present, uh, pleased and proud to announce uh, Professor uh, Philip Russell. It's, it's actually the third time here in Ankara. Uh, the first time was about six, seven years ago, during my first year at Weekend. He was here present uh, as a Leo's distinguished speaker, and uh, he was also present a few years ago, I think in 2009, to attend a workshop that was organized here. Um, it's wonderful to have him here back again. So, um, Philip Russell is already extremely well known to all of you, I suppose, and I, I don't think he needs much introduction. I just want to uh, mention a few highlights. He received his PhD in 1979, University of Oxford. From 1978, he was a junior fellow at Oriel College in Oxford, and in 1982 he moved to Technical University of Hamburg, and as a Van Humboldt Fellow, in 1986 he joined the University of Southampton to the Fiber Optics Group, where he worked on <coughs> began the realization of his idea of the photonic crystal fiber, uh, which was demonstrated practically in 1996. And between 1996 and 95, uh, 2005, Russell worked at the University of Bath, where he built up and led the uh, Photonics and Materials, Photonic Materials Group. After that, he joined the Max, Max Planck Research Group at the Institute of Optics at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, which has then been converted into the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. Um, and I believe he's going to be the president of OSA uh, starting next year. And um, so it's wonderful to have him here again, and I'm happy to announce his talk. Please. to tell you a little bit about uh, some of our recent work uh, making use of microstructured optical fibers to enhance the interaction between light and matter. Um, uh, my, my group, as, as, as was mentioned by, by, uh, by Uma, is uh, the Einstein Institute now, and it's based in Erlangen in Germany, that's in south of Germany, so it's in the area, um, and we've been doing since 2009. The institute is quite a new one. Um, the aim of investigating the science of light. Um, these microstructured fibers, well, they, they look like a standard piece of optical fiber. I'm sure many of you have worked with them or seen them or felt them or lifted them up. Um, but if you look in an electron microscope at the, uh, the transverse structure, you see a range of different, uh, different types depending on the fiber you're looking at. You might find one that has a solid glass core, with color channels in a kind of periodic array around it. You might find one with a solid glass core and very large hollow channels, which uh, make the core quite, quite isolated from the surroundings because these are hollow. Uh, you, this is a very uh, unusual fiber that has two very thin uh, nanoscale membranes of glass. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some experiments we're doing that during this, uh, this lecture. Um, there's also the hollow core uh, versions of the photonic crystal fiber. Lots and lots of different structures. It's, it's very difficult to answer the question, what is a photonic crystal fiber or what is a microstructured fiber? Because it can be almost anything, just, just limited by what you can make. People are often interested in how we actually make them, but some of you may not know this. But the technique we use uh, nearly all the time is to we take capillaries of glass, these are about a millimeter in diameter, and we very carefully stack them in a high pass clean room build up a kind of preform of the, of, the, of the shape that we want to have in the final fiber. Um, this takes a lot of care and a lot of time, but with patience we can do it. We're actually hoping to, to, to design a robot to do this for us in the future. It would be much more sensible than doing it by hand. That's the first stage. And yeah, as you can see, it's about uh, two, two or three centimeters across. In the next stage, we take this and we put it into a high-tech 
fairness, the variable fairness, we push the, the um, stack of, of juice and convert it into the furnace. This is running at nearly 2,000 degrees, so it's very, very bright. You can't look at it, it's so bright. Uh, the silica glass softens at this temperature, and eventually the end of this uh, stack drops off when the glass softens. You see this diminishes at the top off. It drops off to the bottom of the furnace, and this strand of glass, we draw that down to about a millimeter in diameter using these wheels, we put it at constant speed. So we end up with something one millimeter in diameter that has the microstructure, well not microstructure, it has the structure we want in its cross section. Surprisingly this works. And then the final stage of this process, when we take the, these, uh, these, these uh, structured canes that we make here and we draw them down to fiber in the final stage. Sometimes we might just do this in one stage, sometimes in three stages, but this is basically it. At the end we end up with a drum, which can have hundreds of liters of, uh, of an optical fiber that has some kind of some form of nanostructure or microstructure in its cross section. So the, if you think about the aspect ratios, you might have uh, the smallest structure in the microstructure could be maybe less than 100 nanometers. Um, the period might be something like 10 microns, and the length of the fiber could be hundreds of meters. So you, you've got a whole lot of different length scales there in the structure. The beauty is that you, you can do it, if it works, you get a very long length of a nanostructured fiber so that you have lots and lots of material to do in your experiments. Just look at the aspect ratio of this. This is what we start with. If you like the stack of glass capillaries, we reduce this in the first stage down to about a, a millimeter, and then in the final stage by another factor of 10 down to more or less the size that we want in the final fiber. And I think it's a tribute to the properties of silica glass if this is possible, or indeed to any glass if this is possible. So I've got um, four subtopics I'd like to tell you about. These are all uh, quite different experiments, but making use of the unique opportunity that these fibers give us uh, for doing new physics, for investigating light matter interactions. The first one has to do with using light to push small particles of dielectric around. Um, now this guy may or may not be propelled by light, but I couldn't resist the picture. It goes back 100 years. Um, I don't know if he's been driven by light or not. He doesn't look awfully happy. Anyway, never mind. Uh, <laughs> the kind of fiber that we're working with here is the holocore variety. And um, this, this holocore photonic crystal fiber, it, it gives you basically diffraction-free propagation in a holocore. Uh, this is the first time it's been possible to keep, to, to keep light tightly, to keep light in a single mode in basically empty space. So the core is empty space, or could be. You could take the air out of it and it's vacuum. This, this has never been possible before. Um, and how does it work? Well, we use the photonic band gap, uh, a two-dimensional photonic band gap, which uh, exists in the cladding, um, and this keeps the light in the core. So it's a, a total internal reflection, which of course is the mechanism by which telecommunications fibers work. It doesn't work here because the refractive index is the wrong way around. Um, anyway, that's the picture. And the reason this fiber is interesting for pushing particles around has to do with laser tweezers. And I know there's some very good groups here working on, on laser tweezers. Um, Giovanni, for example, saw his, his work this morning. You're probably all familiar with these early experiments by Arthur Ashkin when he was at Bell Labs. Um, he was playing around with laser beams and he discovered you could trap uh, small dielectric particles just above the focus of the lens. Uh, the reason it gets trapped there has to do with um, the fact that the particle experiences radiation forces that push it towards the center of the laser beam, and if you work out all the different uh, momentum transfer events due to refraction and reflection inside the sphere, there's also a backward pushing force that uh, counteracts the repulsive force and the particle just sits there. So you can you move the laser beam around, you can move the particle around. Hence, it's called laser tweezers. But what I was intrigued by, and this is over 10 years ago now, was to do this in the hollow core fiber, because in that case, you would have eliminated diffraction. You, you would have the non-diffracting laser beam um, in the hollow core fiber. And so if a particle happened to get pulled into this, this laser beam or this mode, it would experience continuous acceleration, constant acceleration due to the light, or constant force, if you like, due to the light. Um, uh, and this force, uh, because the beam itself is not, is not diffracted. So in principle, you could accelerate the particle to 
person of disputed life if there wasn't anything else in the court. We haven't done that, of course. But in practice, the core is, is filled with air, or maybe a liquid if you're working with liquids. So it's, 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 the particle reaches a terminal velocity because viscosity balances the force of the light. Anyway, this is the basis. And the first thing I'd like to show you is some results. These are some, a few years old now. Um, on, on liquid filled hollow core photonic crystal fiber. In this case, what we do is we fill the entire structure of the fiber with a liquid. I think in these experiments, it was either water or D2O. I think this was deuterium oxide being used in this case. Um, if you do this, there, there happens to be a quite simple scaling law explained in this paper, which lets you predict uh, uh, where the guidance band of the hollow core fiber. By the way, the photonic band gap guiding fibers, they only guide within a certain uh, wavelength, band of wavelengths, just where the band gap back can actually keep the light in the core. Um, so when you fill it with liquid, you change the structure, but you change it in a, <coughs> in a predictable way, and you can show the fact that the, if the wavelength at which the fiber guided was, was lambda air, then you multiply it by this factor, where well, this is the index of the liquid, this is the index of the gas, and that's the index of air, which is 1. You work out this factor, you can actually get a scaling to the, the wavelength of guidance when the fiber is full of liquids, it's important to know. So if you design it really carefully with D2O, it's a factor of like one half. So having done that, <clears throat> you can then set the whole thing up. This takes a little bit of time, but it's not too difficult. This is the end of the fiber. It's, it's uh, horizontally lying on a glass slide. There's a glass slide here as well, acting as a window, and there's a pool of liquid um, all over the end of the fiber here, along with the fiber suspension. We use normal trees to simply have a particle, bring it up to the entrance space of the hollow fiber, and then we turn on a launching beam that pushes the light into the fiber. At uh, the other end, uh, we were interested in looking at the effects of fluid flow. We had a reservoir of liquid, we could change the pressure head, and we could create more or less fluid flow in the backward direction along the hollow core. So one of the ideas here was to see if we could balance the the, the fluid forces against the optical forces. We'll come back to that in a moment. Here's some pictures. Here's the end of the fiber. There's the particle sitting at the end face. Uh, this is a side view of the particle sitting at the end face. The light, the liquid is flowing out. And it's making the particle rotate, actually. You can see this in a, in a fixed picture. And this is what happens after you launch. Uh, you have a bright scattering spot. This is typical of this. Of course, the light comes in, it hits the particle, it's strongly scattered. So you can easily see where the particle is. And it's going at about 100 micrometers per second in this case. For powers, I think, of about 100 milliwatts. Um, it is actually possible to balance the viscous forces uh, using the optical forces. <coughs> this works uh, very well. In fluids, um, here's just a plot of the, of, the, of the data. You can see they, they line a straight line. So if you have 100 milliwatts and a particle of, say, 1 micron, you, you would need a pressure gradient of whatever this is, kilopascals per centimeter. Um, now the reason this is interesting for us is that we're working with colloidal chemists and also people in biology looking at individual cells. We're interested in being able to, to keep a, an individual particle or cell in a particular position and then explore what happens when you hit it with light or when you pass the biochemicals past the cell. Um, and, and you look at the spe spectroscopic effect that has, maybe fluorescent lifetime in imaging, all kinds of things can be used to, to monitor what's going on to the particle whenever you're, say, coding it or etching it or doing something like that. This is ongoing research, but this was the basic demonstration that this would actually work. Um, I mean, noise could happen. Does that mean? Coming from the computer, actually, if it's not in the sound. Okay, just fill the sound. Okay, good. But I do have some sound I want you to hear in a minute. Let me know when I'm yeah. Okay, great. So we, we, um, one of the things we wanted to do was to be able to monitor the position of the particle. Because in these experiments, we can send the particle um, in, in the liquid filled case over meter kind of length. So these are quite long compared to most experiments in laser tweezers. Um, and if the core is, is, is hollow, it's full of air, you can send it meters or tens of meters. So it's not always easy to know exactly where it is, and, and you might not necessarily want to go to the place where the particle is. Maybe you're sending it into some unpleasant environment. Um, so there is a very nice way of, of working out its position very accurately, and this is just to use the Doppler shift. Um, and in this experiment, you send the light in, it pushes the particle along, it's going to some velocity, you get some Doppler shifted light from the particle scattered backwards, 
This interferes with light that comes off the end phase of the fiber, which is at the original frequency. And these two frequencies then are simply sent to um, uh, a square law detector, so the Buddha or something like that. You could actually make this one more complex and, and uh, with a couple of drag cells and, and uh, monitor whether the frequency shift is upwards or downwards. But this is the simplest, simplest case. This actually works, works rather well. Um, and this is an example of um, a single particle being pushed along. And it turns out that the um, it turns out that the uh, the frequency that you the Doppler shift is actually in the audible range. It sounds like a few hundred hertz to me. Um, it's being pushed along as a particle, and this is the actual speed of the particle which we calculate from the from the, from the uh, frequency. You notice it oscillating up and down, and this turns out to be because uh, we're exciting a small amount of higher order mode in the fiber. Because the higher order mode and the fundamental mode they beat, there's a beat pattern, the particle's being pushed through the beat pattern, and as a result it's kind of wobbling from side to side, and it experiences a slightly different force depending on where it actually finds itself. So you see a change in the velocity. Another experiment we did, which was a lot of fun, <laughs> we're planning to do some more work in this direction, uh, was uh, to launch two spheres into the hollow core fiber full of liquid and see what happens. In this case, here are two Doppler signals, one from each of the particles, and they're at different frequencies, as you'd expect, because they're going at different speeds. But what is fascinating is they seem to be talking to each other. They're having a conversation about something. But they aren't able to use sine waves, they aren't able to, the only way they can communicate is through the light. So, so something is going on between two particles aligned with the two influence each other. And we believe this that is, has to do with the, the, the scattering of the incident light into a higher order mode that then travels forward and influences the second influences the second particle. And then there's a reflected light from the second particle back on the first that will influence it as well. So there's a kind of complicated uh, discussion going on between the particles, which could in principle happen with the hundreds of meters apart. If you had a fiber with very little loss and particles sitting 100 meters apart, they would talk to each other, maybe in a useful way, I'm not sure, but it's kind of fascinating to observe this. Before we all get too scared, I'm going to turn it off, get a headache or something. That's the last of my sign. But... <coughs> okay, the next thing we looked at was the air-filled molecule fiber, which we filled with gas. Um, in this experiment, we, we saw something quite unusual, and let me tell this as a kind of story. Um, the PhD student doing the work uh, wanted to measure the velocity of the particle in the, ho the airfield of hollow core. It's actually very difficult to launch the particle, but he managed to do it in the end. Um, and he didn't have any Doppler system in place to measure the speed. It, it goes much faster, it's meters per second in this case, um, for a few hundred milliwatts. So what did he do? He made a couple of marks on the fiber, just with a pen. And uh, the idea was to time, and you could work out the velocity, of course. And what he actually saw was this. This is a picture of the experiment, um, the light pushing particle from the left. This is the mark on the side of the fiber, and this is what he saw. The particle came in at high speed and stopped right in front of the pen mark on the side of the fiber. There it is, it slowed, slowed down. It seems to come in. And you know, as far as you can tell, you look, if you looked along the core, it's completely transparent. There's nothing there. You know? Particles coming along, there's absolutely nothing to stop it. But it stops, bounces off something invisible, and comes back. Um, very strange, at least it was to us the first time we saw it. It's completely reproducible. It happens every time. Um, and uh, we, we did eventually work out what was going on, partly through a lot of discussions, but partly through the hard work of Oliver Schmidt, uh, who's the PhD student who did the work. And it turns out that what we're seeing here is a unique combination of radiation forces and forces due to Knudsen flow, or transitional Knudsen flow in a capillary. Now, if you're not involved in thermodynamics or engineering, you may not know what this is. But basically, let me, let me just summarize. If you have, um, uh, say, a, a tube or a capillary, and these are the walls of the capillary, and there's a temperature gradient between cold to hot, then within the mean free path of molecular collisions, if you imagine a layer, and actually the Knudsen number has to do with the ratio between the mean free path and the characteristic dimension. That's all it is, the Knudsen number, which is related to this. If you, in this sort of situation, it turns out that the, um, 
there is a thermal creep flow along the interface from the cold part to the hot part. And I'm not going to explain the details of that here, just to say that this is well known. So the, the, the molecules get pumped from the left to the right, and then they reach the hot region. There's no longer a gradient here. There's constant temperature, so there's no longer any creep flow. What does it do? It turns around, goes back along the center of the fiber back, uh, creating a back pressure flow. And the fluid will just flow around in a circle in this situation. And this is why it's called the Knudsen's pump. You can actually pump gas in one direction using this. Of course, this back flow acts against the particle. The particle is being pushed by the light from left to right. And this Knudsen flow is pushing it from right to left. And these two forces, just like in the case of the liquid-filled polypore fiber, balance each other, except here it's done automatically, um, and the particle comes to, to a halt. We see a stable trapping position. Um, it's independent of power. You can vary from 30 to 200 milliwatts. It stays where it is. The reason for that is that the thermal force is proportional to the optical power, as is the optical force, the radiation force. And what happens is the light comes in, strongly scattered, maybe 50 milliwatts, hits this dark mark. It absorbs the light, it heats up, creates a pressure gradient, a uh, temperature gradient, sorry, and this drives the Knudsen flow until the particle stops. You can model it and get very good agreement with experiments. You can also replace this absorbing mark with simply a hot finger of some sort. You can change the temperature, and uh, it's very easy then. You just come in with your hot finger, and the particle is coming along, you stop it. You can push it back to a point where you want it to be, let go. You can catch it again, send it back. Let go. You can have a lot of fun. It's kind of particle ping pong, kind of. <laughs> Reason we're doing this work? Well, we're interested in measurements on single cells and particles, as I mentioned. We're interested in photochemical reaction monitoring and catalysis. And we're also interested in a basic sense in microfluidics in these fibers, in liquids and gases on this sort of nanoscale or micron scale. We're interested in accelerating particles to high speeds in the whole core. We're interested in what happens to the van der Waals interactions when you're, when you're a particle traveling at very high speed, very close to a solid interface. Um, we're not there yet, but it's one of the aims. Okay, so my next topic has to do with um, a new kind, or not such a new kind, I guess, but a, 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 a kind of optical nonlinearity which is created by optomechanical forces. And this comes to the, the dual nanoweb fiber, we call it, um, uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, now, this field of optical mechanical forces between waveguides, there's been a lot of papers on this over the years, over the last decade or so. Um, actually, not even a decade, less than a decade. <clears throat> and it's been known for a long time that a pair of dynamic waveguides, if given the chance, will move towards each other when you launch light into both of the waveguides at the same time. Um, sometimes this is called optical glue. Uh, or optical adhesion, something like that. There's been a lot of nice work on this. There's some examples of the papers. What we wanted to do was make a fiber like this. Um, and I think this was four years ago or so, a bit more. I suggested to the fabricators they might like to have a go at making this. Um, they didn't look very convinced, because this is a very difficult thing to make using glass drawing. But anyway, the idea was, was fairly simple. We wanted to make two suspended, air-suspended, air-clad silica membranes. We call them nanowebs. We want two. We want them to be less than a micron apart, so that if you launch light into each of them, uh, you will get some interaction between the light guided in, in each, of the, each of the webs. Um, and the, 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 one, of the, one of the original aims of this work um, was, and it still is actually, was to observe optomechanical self-channeling. Um, the, the way this works is that um, initially the uh, the, the webs are, are flat and straight, so, so there is no confinement of light in this, in this uh, dimension. So from, from, from left to right, there's no confinement of light. But then as you turn up the optical power, you get an optical gradient pressure that pulls the webs together. And this increases the, then you get a mechanical deflection, which, which distorts the webs. This, this then changes the geometry of the structure and actually creates a high refractive index in the center. And, and you calculate the electronic field distribution again, and uh, you end up, after a few iterations of this in theory, you end up with a self-channeled or self-guided optical beam um, in the fiber. We'd still like to see this, we haven't seen this yet, um, but just to mention a connection with optical tweezers, the way this works, an easy way to think of this working is you can view this as a laser beam, 
and this is a particle, and the particle gets pulled into the highest intensity point, or tries to get into the highest intensity point of the laser beam. So naturally it gets pulled downwards. The other way around, if this is the laser beam and this is the thing that's being pulled, it gets pulled upwards. So they mutually attract through a kind of laser tweezer effect, you could say. So here is uh, one of the structures that the fabrication team made. Uh, there's the nicest picture of a zoom in of it. Um, the web thickness is about 400 nanometers. It varies a bit, as you can see. Spacing is about half a micron between them. And the width in this direction is 22 micrometers. And of course, the length of the fiber can be meters or tens of meters. It turned out in this case, and this, this turned out to be quite a good thing, um, it turned out that the webs were slightly thicker in the middle, which meant that they were able to guide light even at very low intensity. So there was no, no self-channeling here. Simply it was it acted as a waveguide at very, just as a linear structure, which was quite good because it meant that we could, we could actually launch light into the structure and measure the optomechanical nonlinearity if there was any. And to do this, we took the sample, we placed it in a matter sender and interferometer. Um, so the probe light came in and uh, gets sent around the interferometer and we measure the, uh, the fringes uh, at the output. At the same time, we drive the structure with an amplitude modulated pump at 1550 nanometers. This is a much stronger pump signal. Um, the idea being that we change the frequency of this, we can measure the frequency response of the optomechanical nonlinearity, assuming we can measure it at all. Uh, it turns out we were able to measure it very easily. This sample is about seven centimeters long. Um, here is the drive signal, the blue, the, the pump, up and down. And the frequencies range from zero up to 10 megahertz or so, typically in these experiments. Um, this is one of the measurements for a particular frequency. You see the drive signal. You see the response of the interferometer, a certain amplitude. You also notice there's a phase lag between the response and the drive signal. This is not surprising. Uh, this is evidence that we're actually operating um, close to a resonance. Or so, so as you move across a resonance, of course, this phase goes from zero to pi as you go from low to high frequency. Um, uh, the actual response turned out to be pretty much a Lorentzian. Um, this was measured at atmospheric pressure. We got a quality factor of about 20 for, for atmospheric pressure, and here's a phase response. Um, if you actually work out the uh, effective fiber nonlinearity, and this is normally given in units of per watt per meter, so you have a piece of fiber, you know that number, you can say what the change in phase is for a certain amount of power over a certain length. So in this case, we have a 14 or so per watt per meter for if you're, if you're non-resonant, so we're not close to the peak of the resonance. At the peak, we're getting 300 per watt per meter. If you compare that with single mode fiber, which has about 2.5 per watt per kilometer, we have an enhancement of nonlinearity about 120,000 times than in the single mode fiber. Now, of course, this is a much slower nonlinearity than the current nonlinearity, but nevertheless, this is a massive factor um, in nonlinearity. This means that uh, if you needed to use a kilometer of fiber before to see something, uh, you, would, you would be able to get away with a 1 20th of a, of a meter of fiber, which is millimeters of fiber instead of a kilometer. It's dramatic. You can really expect to see interesting effects with very short lengths of this, of this structure. Um, something else that uh, we've explored recently is the effects of squeeze, fill, and damping. Some of you may work in MEMS, um, and this is a big topic there. What's the effect of gas on the response of a microelectromechanical system? Um, if the air gets compressed, it's going to viscously damp things. If it's present at all, it's going to have some effect of some sort. Turns out in this structure, we see extreme example of squeeze film damping because the spacing between the membranes is, you know, it's just half a micron and it's 22 microns wide. So you have extremely thin and, and wide uh, little layer of air in between the webs, uh, uh, which um, has, a, has a really strong effect in two senses. First of all, it damps. The, 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 the gas damps the, the, the resonance, the mechanical resonances, which are about 6 megahertz or so. At one atmosphere, we have a resonance at about 6.9 or so megahertz. And as we pump out the gas down to 22 millibar, you can see the Q, Q factor increases. Not surprising. That's because the viscosity is getting less and less. There's less and less damping caused by viscous uh, or by friction. Uh, but at the same time, the resonant frequency is shifting quite strongly down to a lower frequency. And the reason for that 
is quite simple. The gas itself provides a certain amount of mechanical stiffness, and since the resonant frequency of a mechanical oscillator depends on, on the square root of the stiffness, um, it's not surprising that uh, we, we, we see this, this variation it follows very closely this relationship actually, but that's the pressure of the gas. <coughs> now this has been this, this kind of effect has been discussed before in, in the men's field in, in the context of squeeze film damping. But the actual frequency shifts that are seen are very tiny because they don't have anything like such a small space that's filled with air um, between the two mechanical objects that are moving. Um, if you go down to even lower pressures in the microbar range, we see a whole kind of menagerie of, of fine peaks that get sharper and sharper in the structure. Um, and these are all, we, we, we believe these are all resonances that appear at different points along the fiber because it's not perfectly uniform. Um, when we make it, so, so the resonances will, will vary from place to place. We picked on one of these, the, the highest Q one, the one that was strongest that we could measure, and we changed the frequency, and um, just focusing on this peak, or thinking about this peak, uh, we, we, uh, we did an experiment which involved just launching in, not modulated light, light as I've shown you before, but actually CW light, so this is constant intensity light from the laser launched in with a maximum power of about 10 milliwatts, no more than that, launched into the evacuated fiber, and this, the pressure here is, is in the microbar range, um, so 10 to the minus 3 millibar or so, um, and what we find was that at a threshold power of just a few milliwatts, the, the structure itself started to self pulsate started to self-oscillate, um, driven by the light. So this, this um, we'll be doing the theory of this, but it's, uh, it's not completely clear that this is a Raman-like uh, oscillation of this mechanical structure. Um, so it, it's as if this was some kind of gigantic molecule that was very responsive to the light, and could phase modulate the light once it starts to oscillate, which is what Raman scattering is, of course, and it's also driven by the light. So, so you, in fact, you can actually plot out the sidebands. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is the, these are the side bands you, you see appearing. There's a huge scale here, 120 down to uh, zero. This is a dB scale. So we start out with the laser, we increase the power of the laser, and we see a whole, whole pile of peaks uh, appearing in the spectrum as a result of this. These are, if you like, Raman orders, power order Raman Stokes and anti Stokes lines that appear in the structure. The reason you see lots of anti Stokes lines is because the coherence is very long. Um, this, so this mechanical oscillation. There's also a clear threshold as you increase the amount of power and see a threshold of like six milliwatts or so. So there's a lot of interesting things to look at there. Maybe there's some potential applications and so on. Um, but the thing that really drives this is this massive nonlinearity that we have in, in this structure, <coughs> which makes all kinds of things possible. Okay, now I'd like to talk about something else, twisted fibers. Um, and uh, I call the subtitle is putting light into orbit or creating orbital angular momentum in, in the optical fibers. So let me just tell you what this is about. I'm, I'm going to talk in this particular part, I'm not going to talk about um, uh, the hollow core photonic crystal fiber, but I'm going to talk about the solid core variety where the core refractive index is higher than the fatty. So we have guidance by total internal reflection. It has a few interesting additional characteristics you know, because of the hollow channels, but basically this is how it goes. What we're going to do here is twist it. We're going to take the fiber and we're going to, uh, using a technique I'm going to show you in a minute, we're going to twist it quite strongly. Um, these are the hollow channels, these green dots, the other things represent the hollow channels, and you can see the fiber is twisting with a certain pitch, a certain period, and after this distance L, the channels will come back to their original position. Uh, so that's one period of the structure, one period of the, of the helix, if you like. Um, uh, we can define various things here. Uh, we can define a twist rate, which is the number of two pi's per unit length. Uh, so the whole one picture would be two pi. The pitch itself, this L, is much longer than the actual spacing between the holes. So the angle, and also the angle between the hollow channels, between these, um, these holes, if you like, in, and the axis increases with radius period. This is just a geometrical thing. As you move outwards, the, the, the angle gets, gets more and more steep. Actually, people have looked at this kind of <coughs> twisted photonic crystal fiber before. I'd like particularly to mention this paper by Shin and, and, and co-workers from Korea, uh, where they looked at this, and they made some observations. 
but they didn't actually explain the results they had seen. Um, really, uh, they just reported the observation. This is how we do it. There isn't a sign track here. Um, you see, here's the fiber, here's a motor that spins. There's a carbon dioxide laser beam at 10 microns coming in that heats up the glass. 10 microns is absorbed very strongly by silica. And that little white dot you see is the, uh, the silica raised up to a temperature of maybe, I don't know, 12, 13, 1400 degrees. Um, and at the same time, the, the, the motor is spinning the fiber, it's going to do it again. So what you end up at the end of the day, this glass is soft, so it, it, it takes up the soft region, takes up the twist. And it, since it's, it's moving along continuously, the carbon dioxide laser beam, you end up with a permanently twisted photonic crystal fiber. Um, okay, this, this works quite well. Either you take a sample of this that you twisted, stick it into a very simple um, setup involving a supercontinuum spectrum so you can cover a reasonably wide range of wavelengths and look at the transmission as a function of wavelength. And these are two measurements out of a whole, a whole uh, family of measurements that we made for many different fibers for two different values of pitch. So here the pitch is smaller and here the pitch is larger. And you see interesting series of dips in the spectrum. Uh, this is the experimental, this is simulations um, that we carried out as well, so they agree pretty well. So we see these mysterious, as they were mysterious at the beginning, these mysterious dips in the spectrum which move out to longer wavelength. So D, for example, moves out to here, and C to here when the pitch gets smaller. So as the twist rate increases, the wavelengths at which these dips appear, the wavelengths become longer. So the wavelength of the dips looks like it might be proportional to the twist rate, or to one over the pitch. And that turns out to be exactly right. Um, um, this still is one of the most surprising results I think I've ever seen, in my own work at least, to discover that this, this, this really weird looking spectrum that we couldn't explain, if you take the data points and you plot the twist rate versus the wavelength of the dips, those resonances, they all lie exactly on straight lines on this plot. Not only do they lie on straight lines, but the straight lines go through zero here, telling us that whenever the twist rate goes to zero, the wavelength goes to zero, the wavelength of the dips goes to zero. So as the twist rate gets smaller and smaller, all these resonances cluster together at zero frequency and then just disappear, They're gone from the system. So they don't exist in the straight fiber, it just tells us. But if they do exist, they lie on these amazing straight lines. Um, and the wavelength of the dips is actually proportional to one over the pitch. Um, which actually, this is sort of funny, you know, I mean, the first time I talked to people about the twisted fiber, and actually the first time I thought about it myself, I thought this is a long period gradient of some sort. In the gradings, you know, there's a certain pitch in the gradient. After some kind of drag condition or some coupling condition, typically the wavelength of which that happens is proportional to the pitch. It's a kind of golden rule of gradings, if you like. But here we have a totally reverse situation. The wavelength at which we see these features is proportional to one over the pitch. So this is not a long gradient effect, a uh, gradient effect of any sort. And you can, you can see that because actually what the light can, can may be doing is just following the helical twist. It doesn't encounter any scattering, it just keeps twisting. It doesn't see any kind of discontinuity if it can fit into the twisting structure correctly. It doesn't get scattered, so, so it doesn't behave like a gradient. It behaves like an effective medium, actually. So what's the explanation? Well, the simple explanation is as follows. Um, the fiber structure looks like this. Now, it turns out that in the cladding of the photonic crystal fiber, the light is, is concentrated in the regions between the hollow channels. So the glass, this is glass, and these are hollow, these green things are hollow. The light gets kind of uh, channeled between the hollow channels, and it gets sent around Actually, in the cladding, if you launch into the cladding, it gets sent around in a kind of twisting path, in a spiral path. Um, and if you look at that, the light's going at some angle phi to the axis. It has a certain refractive index in the cladding, and there, there'll be, a, as a neutral component of refractive index, this component of refractive index goes around, allows the light to go around in a circle, and if you, if you discretize the azimuthal modes, then you have to fit an integer number of wavelengths into the circumference at a certain radius, you come up then, for these resonances, you come up with a simple equation which involves the refractive index NSM, the radius at which this appears, rho squared, the twist rate alpha, equals some integer times lambda over 2 pi. 
Um, but this, this is immediately, I think, for anyone who works with OAN, this is a signature of the angular momentum, this lambda over 2 pi factor. Um, uh, this equation gives us that the twist rate is proportional to the wavelength of the resonance, which is exactly what we see in the experiments. And in fact, you get really beautiful agreement these are with theory. These, these lines are, in fact, theory uh, based on this simple equation. And we have to choose a certain value for rho squared times NSM to, to make the fits. But once you've got that number, it makes them all fit beautifully. This is one of the finite element uh, calculations of the pointing vector uh, distribution across the fiber at one of these bit points. The sunlight in the core, it couples to this, um, to this ring mode in the cladding, a very complex kind of uh, structure, very beautiful. And what the light is doing, as it goes down the fiber, is twisting continuously. With no, like I said, there's no reflection, there's no scattering of any sort. It just follows the pattern, provided that the light has the correct solution of Maxwell's equations, it can just follow that twisting pattern without any scattering. Um, and uh, this is another one of the modes that's now going backwards, but that's not because it actually is, it's because your brain thinks it is. Did you see it go backwards? Yes. <laughs> just checking that I see it. Um, so this is another one, another one of these modes that's got nicely um, localized. Uh, there, there is actually an interesting connection to the 1940s here with this guy, Rudy Kompner, who actually was kind of half my PhD supervisor when I was at Oxford. There he is with John Pierce, and I uh, forget who the other guy is in the picture there. But anyway, he invented the traveling wave tube, which is, is a way to phase match um, an electron beam to an electromagnetic wave. Of course, the electromagnetic wave is typically traveling much faster than the electron beam. So what do you do? You send the electromagnetic wave around the spiraling wire of a helix. So the, the RF signal, or the microwave signal, comes in here. It, it's slowed down in terms of its phase progression along the axis because it's going around in a helical path. And so you can kind of phase match the electrons to the, lot, to the, to the microwaves in this case. It makes a wonderful amplifier. <clears throat> it's a lot more complicated, actually, how it works than what I just said. Basically, the phase matching condition is so correct. We're doing something similar in the fiber here, <clears throat> in terms of this is the refractive index, effective axial refractive index, plotted versus radius, so a little bit of core. So this is the actual refractive index of the silica, first of all, the top. This is one, which is the index of the air. And if you just cross the holes, you're going to go from one to zero, as you go across the, uh, from the silica to, to one. The core mode will sit in the straight fiber somewhere like here. The fundamental space filling mode in the cladding, the highest index you can get, will sit on this red line in the cladding. And so you get wave value because the index of the mode is higher than the index of the cladding. If you twist this structure, however, because these modes in the cladding are confined by the hollow channels, they're forced to have a longer path length by a factor equal to this. So the further you go out in radius, depending on the twist rate also, the, further, the larger the radius, the more the increase in effective refractive index along the fiber is through a topological increase in the optical path length. It's quite a subtle point here, and it's, it takes a little bit of getting used to. But um, what this tells us is that the core mode can become phase matched to modes in the cladding, simply because of this factor. It turns out this actually explains quite well what we see when we do the finite element modeling. We do indeed see factors of this sort of order matching the core mode to the, to the cladding mode. Now, something else that you'll notice here, that if you do get light into the ring mode, which is out here, which is this OAM mode, it will continue to leak out to the regions of higher, even higher refractive index. So these modes are intrinsically lossy um, in the cladding. Okay, it's a new kind of uh, cladding mode, topological phase matching, with all kinds of nice things actually you could do with this. So, in maybe 10 minutes, I'll, I'll probably finish up, maybe a little bit longer. But my last topic has to do with generating, generating ultraviolet light. This is something completely different. I'm going back to holocore fiber now. Um, I don't accept any responsibility for this picture, except that the title of the movie was Ultraviolet. I think it's a movie, I'm not even sure. <laughs> so, this, uh, this topic um, has become the biggest, probably the biggest um, subgroup in my division of the Max Planck Institute. And it involves gases. It involves putting gases into the holocore fiber. 
The kind of, uh, the kind of photonic crystal fiber we're using here is what we call a Kagome style lattice, which actually was discovered by one of my postdocs when I was at Bath, Peter Bernabe, who's now a professor in uh, Limoges in France, under the director of CNRS. Um, but he, he was playing around in the fiber drawing room at the University of Bath in England, and uh, he uh, came up with this structure, <coughs> which has an interesting uh, lattice um, design in, in, the, in the cladding. Actually, it's slightly distorted, but if I, if I just put in some construction lines to indicate what the perfect structure would look like, these dashed lines represent the perfect structure. And there's some expansion of the core relative to, what, how, to the size it should be, because you can see these white lines are slightly further right. The reason for that is that we pressurize the preform when we're drawing the fiber, and the larger hole will tend to expand more quickly than the narrower holes, for obvious reasons, I think, to do with surface tension. <coughs> so, this is the Kabilmi lattice. It turns out to be a tiled star of David. If you do it, you, if you tiled one of these, you get, you get a Kabilmi lattice. This um, particular design of fiber has a very interesting and unusual characteristic, is that, that is that it guides white light. And this was what was so surprising whenever Feta Benavi did this initial measurement. He discovered that <coughs> just, I mean, normally when you make a photonic band gap fiber, you launch some white light in, you get a color coming out. You get red or blue or some infrared wavelength. You, you never get a full broad spectrum of white light. But in this case, we saw white light coming out. And it turned out that this particular design was able to guide ultra broadband uh, light with losses that were quite a lot higher than in the band gap fiber, about one decibel per meter, possibly a bit lower in some cases. But nevertheless, accept acceptable values of all you need to use as a short length of fiber for, for an experiment. And the mechanism here it turns out to be a kind of two-dimensional generalization of these arrow, this arrow mechanism. Arrow is anti-reflecting, anti-resonant reflecting optical waveguides, which was worked on was more than 10 years ago in Quebec, in Canada, by Michel Degas. But he was looking at planar structures, where it's much simpler to explain. In the two-dimensional case, it's a bit more complicated. But this is very specific the mechanism. So it's not a photonic band gap guy. It's something a little different. Anyway, the holocore fiber, for, if you want to do nonlinear optics and gases, holocore fiber is perfect because the light remains trapped in a single mode in empty space. And of course, you can fill the empty space with gases. Um, you have reproducible propagation characteristics, no diffraction, and so on. Um, Self-focusing is much less difficult at very high intensities in the hollow core because the wave guidance tends to, tends to mask the effects or suppress the self-focusing effects. You have long path lengths, potentially. Very important, you have an absence of optical damage. You also get very high intensities for a given power because the core area can be very small in these fibers. But the most interesting and exciting thing about these fibers with gas in them is that by changing the pressure, you can tune the modal refractive index. In fact, you, you have an optical fiber where you can tune not just the modal refractive index, but the dispersion. So let's just have a look. This is, uh, this is one of these fibers, and um, it gives you broadband guidance. It gives you low light glass overlap, so high damage threshold. And this is what the dispersion does. Dispersion turns out to be have small values, sort of between minus 1 and 1 in picoseconds squared per kilometer. So this is quite a small value of dispersion compared to single mode fiber. It's, uh, it's, it's low, but, but even nicer is that in the empty fiber, the dispersion across this huge frequency range, the wavelengths go all the way from 200 nanometers in the ultraviolet to 2,000 nanometers, the dispersion of the hollow waveguide is anomalous over this entire range, as you can see. And as we go to shorter and shorter frequencies, the dispersion becomes closer and closer to zero. Um, and it's anomalous. Uh, any gas that you want to put in the core is going to have normal dispersion in this frequency range. So the normal dispersion of the gas counterbalances the anomalous dispersion of the hollow core and allows you to push that curve upwards. These are uh, curves for argon gas, so two atmospheres, 5, 10, 20, and 30. We can radically change the shape of that dispersion curve and we can create a dispersion zero that is pressure tunable just by changing the pressure of the gas. Turns out this allows us to, has allowed us to, to come up with a new way of generating tunable ultraviolet light from relatively modest pulse energies um, in the infrared 800 nanometers. The experiment is quite simple. We take 
a relatively short length, by which I mean 20, 30 centimeters of the fiber, a couple of gas cells, um, and pumping equipment and so on to evacuate and then fill with the gas we want. Then there are windows on the gas cells where we can send the light in and a whole bunch of diagnostics of the output. And what I'm going to show you is the first observation um, of what we saw in the lab. The pulses are coming in from the left. We're increasing the energy of the pulses with time from about 1 to 10 microjoules or so, that sort of range. And uh, this is what we observed as the energy of this video, what we observed as the energy of the pulse was increased with time. You notice that the first thing that happens is the far end of the fiber lights up quite brightly, and, and this the length, the, the fraction, the, the length of fiber that's lit up with, with white or bluish light increases as the energy of the pulse goes up. And at maximum energy, it's reached the nearest position to the input launch end of the fiber. So if something is going on here, it depends on the pulse energy, and it's causing generation of visible light in the hollow core. It wasn't clear to us what this visible light was, where it came from, whether it was fluorescence, or we had no idea initially. But of course we had the diagnostics to look at what was coming out. <coughs> what we discovered was that we were generating ultraviolet light in the fundamental mode of the core, in a nice single mode, <coughs> with efficiencies up to 8% from the infrared to the ultraviolet. And most exciting of all, efficiency is pretty impressive, but most exciting of all was that the wavelength of this band was pressure tunable and energy tunable. Um, so if we change the, um, the, the energy of the, of the incoming pulses, the, the wavelength would shift to shorter wavelength. If we reduce the pressure, it would also shift to shorter wavelength. Here is uh, the results of some calculations for the uh, Again, this is a picture of the experiment. There's the onset of the, of the visible light that you see from the side. It turns out to be fluorescence, but anyway, this is the onset. Um, we do some numerical modeling. This illustrates what's going on. The pulse going in has a duration of about 30, 20 seconds. It goes into a, a, a medium, into a fiber filled with gas, where the pressure is such that we have a low value of anomalous dispersion, so we can have a soliton. It's a high water soliton. So it, it compresses in the first cycle of its evolution down to a close to a single cycle pulse or a few cycle pulse at a temporal focus. And at this temporal focus, the intensities can be as high as 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter squared, which is high enough to do all sorts of things, including ionize the gas if you want to. But if you avoid ionization, you can get the generation of deep QB light here. It is coming out of the side here. And this is the same thing, but in the frequency domain. This is frequency versus propagation length, in, in, in both cases, of course. You see the broadening of the soliton of the pulse going in, it gets broader and broader, of course it gets smaller, it's narrower and narrower in time, and then at the point of maximum compression, the bandwidth is largest, and you see the deep ultraviolet light emerging um, uh, at that point. Okay, now I haven't really explained what's going on here. Here's an ideal seventh order soliton. You can see it goes in, pulse goes in, it focuses down to a very sharp spike, and then it goes through a complicated periodic evolution and comes back to its original shape, or a perfect seventh order soliton. <clears throat> For that particular soliton, you can take a linear dispersion, which has just a beta 2, nothing higher. You get a curve for linear dispersion, frequency versus square vector, for the beta 2 omega squared. Omega, is the, omega 0 is at a particular optical frequency. If we form a soliton, then this curve becomes straight because all the frequencies in the soliton have the same group velocity. The soliton doesn't disperse, <coughs> so they lie on that curve. Now, if we actually add in some higher order dispersion, some beta 3, and we do this seventh order of propagation again, we see something interesting. We see the pulse compresses to a very sharp pulse, but then at the point of maximum compression, the soliton breaks up. You get a fission process. It breaks up into all sorts of complicated uh, structures, but at that point, we see a band of ultraviolet light emerging. And something is going on here that creates high frequencies. And it turns out what's happening here is that if we add in higher order dispersion, this linear curve turns around and crosses with the soliton dispersion curve at this point. So we have what's known as resonant radiation, where the soliton is able to phase match in frequency and wave vector with the freely running linear waves. And if you want to know a bit more about this, I strongly recommend you read this very nice paper from last year, 
where they explain the high efficiency of this process in terms of cascaded four-way mixing. This is from Guri Genti, a very nice paper. Um, but it puts the final piece of the jigsaw in as to how this actually works. Um, now you can tune with pressure, um, you can tune the zero dispersion point with the point at which the UV is generated with pressure from 10 atmospheres to 1 atmosphere. The zero can be tuned over this, over this range, so we have tunable ultraviolet light. And if you do a lot of careful experiments with different gases, Kathai uh, uh, Mackey, my group PhD students, achieved between 1 and 8 percent conversion over this entire uh, frequency range from the vacuum ultraviolet with neon right up to the visible using xenon. Okay, so, so we, we are very excited about this and there's lots of things you can do here. This, this gas flow fiber is also ideal for pulse compression. The pulse can, you can compress very energetic pulses down to very short duration. Um, we published an optics letter on that uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and you, can, you can also ionize the gas and see some fascinating interactions between the, the plasma generated, the free electrons generated, and the, and, and the pulse. Um, all sorts of wonderful things. But I, I don't want to talk about it too much today, so I'm just going to finish with this. This gas-based non-neuroptics and photonic crystal fiber, what it's allowed us to do is take <coughs> low-loss single mode. If you have some low-loss single mode holocore photonic crystal fiber and fill the core with gas, this allows us to forget about the fact that the gas is a gas. And gas experiments are difficult. I mean, you have a gas cell, you put a laser beam in, it self focuses, and all kinds of weird things happen. Uh, gases have low nonlinearity, so they haven't got a long path length. They're hard to work with. And anyone who's worked with gases will agree with that. But the fiber, what we can do is treat them like solid state materials. We no longer need to think about them as gases. We have a perfect single mode guided in the, ho in the hollow core. Um, so, the big advantage of solid state materials, though, is that unlike solid state materials, we, we have pressure tunable dispersion, unimaginable in a solid material, um, and we also have an incredibly high damage threshold. If you tried to put 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter squared into a solid fiber, you wouldn't have a hope of ever seeing anything out the other end, because the glass would just damage. So, these two characteristics added to the fact that we can treat the gas as a solid state material I think it's just a fantastic opportunity in, 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 in this field. That's all I plan to talk about, so thank you for coming and listening to me. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, the talk is open for questions. itself is only slightly perturbed by the twist. It, it, it does develop a small amount of angular momentum caused by the fact that the mode is not perfectly circular. It has little spokes that stick out into the, in between the hollow channels. And you're forcing it to twist. And it turns out that uh, the, the effect of that twist on the core mode, you just look at the core mode, and actually not even look at those dips in the spectrum, just look in between. The core mode is being forced to spin, as I showed, I think, in this spinning thing. Yeah, so, so, so if you think about the core mode, it's traveling, if, if there isn't any resonance, so you don't see this mode, you, you don't see the ring mode, but just concentrate on the core mode, you can see that it has spokes that are sticking out into the cladding. So it's twisting as it travels. And it turns out that this has the effect of creating um, uh, optical activity, which is circular barofringence. So the left circular polarized light has a different phase velocity from right circular polarized light. And if you launch in linear polarization state, it will rotate 
very well controlled way along the fiber because of the optical activity um, as a result of, of the twisting. I recommend you don't look at this for too long because you won't be able to stand up afterwards. <laughs> there was another question back there. <clears throat> so you said that you can adjust the bandwidth by uh, adjusting the pressure. Yeah. So can you slow down the light by compressing the bandwidth? Um, Have you tried this, such a thing? Can we slow down the light by let me just get uh, slow down the bandwidth let me just get this. Um, why would why would compressing the pulse slow down the light? So I can ask you a question so I can answer you. <laughs> so you couple the optical uh, resonating wavelength. Yeah. So you can tune uh, the bandwidth of the structure by tune, by introducing some uh, optical cavities oh. just coupled to the yeah. chrome. And by tuning the resonance frequency, you can tune the bandwidth. So by using that, you can uh, slow down light. Oh, I see. So, so are you talking about the gas filled fiber or not? Yeah. You are talking about that. Um, well, in this case, we don't have any kind of resonance uh, next to the core. There isn't anything like that going on. Um, so, I, I, I mean, cool. could you slow down light? I'm not sure, but we aren't doing that here. There isn't any way we can do that in this, in this particular experiment. Um, we have done some. We, we did publish a paper on, on uh, another interesting effect, which is, is that uh, if you do launch, if you launch a soliton, um, oh, it's too complicated to explain, but you can, you can actually get a soliton to move to higher frequency through self, through ionization of the gas. And ionization of the gas causes a blue shift of the frequency of the pulse, it turns out, because the refractive index changes rapidly to, to, a, to a lower value, to negatively, and this gives rise to higher frequencies and allows the pulse to move adiabatically to higher frequency. At the same time, it compresses. So you have a combination of compression and frequency shift. Um, there wasn't time to talk about that today, but I think that's a interesting. But that, that's not really slow light, though. The light does slow down a bit. The quick velocity gets less, but it maybe goes up, but it's... Uh, it's not what you were thinking, I think. Thank you. Uh, maybe I get a chance to ask a question. Here's a blue sky one. The uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN is tens of kilometers long. Yeah. Equal length of fiber would fit into the cabinet over there. Yeah. Technical issues aside, could you even imagine having an electric field along the axis with some design and accelerate charged particles in a, you know, in, in a hollow core fiber with vacuum inside. It would be nice. <laughs> um, I think I might try and do it with light. Because we, 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 we are in the process of making linear pole traps for charged particles. And this involves putting very long, narrow, well, nanoscale wires and along the fiber around the hollow core. So if you have four of those and you put the right voltage on, you can trap a charged particle in the hollow core. Um, but once you've got the particle trapped in the hollow core, you could then accelerate it with light. If you could evacuate the core to about a degree, and that's the difficulty of getting the pressure to be low enough so that you can really get up to high speeds. Um, but, but this is a fascinating area I mean, that we are looking at at the moment, but we're interested in trying to do something like that. Um, but uh, the, the kind of things that we see that uh, prevent us at the moment are, are well known in this field. Uh, that if you try to trap a particle and you reduce the pressure of the gas, that there's a kind of range of pressure where things just go totally unstable because because the, the um, collisions with the molecules of the gas are, are so disruptive to the process that the particle just jumps out of the trap. And this is quite well known, I think, in the field. But if you can get past that point, somehow or other by doing some trick, and get down to very low pressures, it becomes stable again. It turns out. So who knows? Maybe. maybe. But what, what worries me, though, is if you did manage to trap maybe a charged particle or an electron or something, in this kind of way, is that once it starts to reach very high velocities, it still has finite mass in the transverse direction. So, so as if it goes around a corner at a high enough speed, it will deflect from the center and crash into the wall. So, so that has to be, I think there's going to be a minimum radius at which um, you can actually realistically trap a particle that has uh, 
has rest mass. I'm not sure. This is all very blue sky, as you said. Any other questions? <clears throat> if not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>